Yeah. Okay, well, thanks uh, very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak. I'm really excited to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that the work that I'm talking about today is uh, mostly done in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Todd Grekus, Grekus who's at New York University. <clears throat> I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm biting off a bit of a cold, so I might sound a little more husky than uh, I would otherwise. So a lot of the work that I have been doing has been concerned with this distinction between passive and active learning. So passive learning uh, is, a, is a kind of experience where learner control is minimized. They can't really uh, have any say over the information that they, they see as they learn. Uh, so kind of uh, traditional lecture-based instruction or rote learning are good kind of classical examples of passive learning. Uh, where there's just, just this kind of tidal wave of information and hopefully you merge on the other side having learned something. I think that there's a, a pretty good consensus, especially within the educational uh, uh, community, that this isn't really the best way for people to learn. Uh, but it's also just not really reflective of how people learn uh, in the real world, as we've already uh, talked about. I'm sure everyone here will agree that this really neglects the fact that people are always taking action to various, uh, to various degrees to control the kinds of information that they experience. Um, so this happens really across the lifespan, across all sorts of different contexts. So there's now increasing evidence that at very early ages, infants and young children are already taking action that, that prefers to reduce uncertainty about, for example, hidden causal mechanisms. Uh, but we also see it in more formal settings like scientific reasoning um, and other stages of education. So people clearly use their uncertainty and their curiosity to drive how they collect information as, as they learn. So today I'm going to talk about some work uh, looking at this kind of mechanism in the context of human category learning. So why is category learning a good kind of domain to look at this in? Well, first, I think you'll agree that, that this is a fundamental way that people gain abstract or generalizable knowledge about how the world works. Uh, but more than that, uh, category learning links our previous experience to uncertainty-driven action. So it's because we have theories of category learning that we can understand why, for example, uh, these pictures that you've probably never seen before probably aren't all that interesting or surprising. But if you come across a picture like this, suddenly, at least I'm a little more curious, a little more interested. Uh, if you came across this, uh, I think it's a dog, uh, on the street, then you'd probably be likely to ask the owner, where did this thing come from? Um, so this uncertainty, which is kind of naturally arising from your prior experience, is driving your, your action, your question asking. So in that way, it's a good domain to start to formalize the link between prior experience and uncertainty-driven uh, action. A second good reason why uh, category learning is a good domain to look at this in is that previous research has really almost exclusively focused on passive learning conditions where people don't really have control over the distribution of items that they experience as they learn. So if you've done any work on category learning then uh, in the cognitive psychology literature, then you're probably familiar with these kinds of diagrams where experimenters painstakingly titrate different distributions of items, uh, often in very kind of baroque ways to discriminate different models, which is all you know, very good and very useful. Uh, but to the extent that people learn about categories in the real world by exerting control over the items that they see, how they allocate attention, uh, then this might underestimate their ability to, to form categories and learn abstract knowledge. And finally, a third reason why uh, uh, we've been interested in, in looking at category learning is that there's been a lot of recent work in machine learning, which also goes by the name of active learning. Uh, that's uh, been demonstrating the kinds of gains in efficiency in learning that you can get from having active selection of training data. So in machine learning applications, you might have a wealth of data, but it might be really expensive to actually label that, right? You might need, uh, for example, a human to step in and say, this picture that's on the internet is actually of a dog, or this one's of a cat, or a dog bear, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, so you can really get a big benefit if you have uh, an intelligent selection of items that a model doesn't know how to classify, for example. So this is giving us a kind of rich set of new ideas and formal methods for thinking about uh, uh, the, the kinds of uh, improvements and efficiency that you can get through active uncertainty-driven selection. So I'm going to start off just by uh, demonstrating kind of the intuitive reason for this for a simple category learning paradigm before I move on to some of uh, our experiments. So if you think about 
uh, a pretty simple uh, category learning problem where you have two distributions of, uh, of items uh, corresponding to two different categories. And your goal is to learn this black line, which is a single dimensional uh, category boundary that separates them. And if you were to just learn through passive observation, then you might just observe randomly generated items from those two clouds over time. But it's easy to see why this might be inefficient. So if I've already seen a few items and I continue to learn through passive observation, well, the most likely thing to happen is that the next item is going to also come from the center of one, the center of, one of those distributions. It's going to be close to the items that I've already seen. I'm probably going to be pretty confident about which category it belongs to, so it's not going to change my beliefs very much. Uh, so uh, we can kind of uh, picture what I might, uh, my, my beliefs might be at this point. I might have formed some hypothesis about where the category boundary is. Uh, and if I can select items that fall close to that boundary, which are kind of equidistant from items from either of the two categories, then there's a, there's a better chance that I'm going to, the, it's going to lead to some outcome that's going to change my belief about where the boundary is. It's going to be more likely to, to lead to learning. So an item in this gray area, which I'm going to refer to as the margin of the category boundary, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if your uncertainty is high uh, because it falls close to this boundary, then uh, through active exploration, you can prefer to choose that thing rather than just wait for whatever is going to be generated next through passive observation. So if people do this kind of an active, uncertainty-driven exploration, what should we expect to see? Uh, first, we'd expect that relative to passive observation, there'd be a faster rise in classification accuracy. There's, there's a higher efficiency for active learning. Uh, but then also, if people are selecting things that are close to, close to their uh, estimate of the uh, category boundary, then over time, you'd expect that the distance of their selections from the true boundary is going to decrease. So as their estimate of the true, true boundary gets more and more precise, their remaining uncertainty is closer and closer to the true one, and they're going to draw items that are closer and closer to the, to the optimal boundary. And importantly, you'd expect that this is going to be a pretty effective uh, strategy across a wide range of category learning problems. Even if uh, there's a more complex category boundary, if there are more uh, uh, possible categories, you can rely on this kind of uncertainty-driven exploration uh, to learn more efficiently than you might through passive observation. So the question is whether or not we see these kinds of patterns in human uh, behavior. So when they control the items that they see during category learning, do they choose items that are close to the, to the margin of the category boundary, and do they learn more efficiently? So today I'm going to talk about our initial attempts at answering these questions. I'm going to talk about three studies. Um, but the overall part, point that I'm going to be driving towards is that uh, the efficacy of active category learning in humans really depends on this pro uh, a latent process of sequential hypothesis generation. And there are a few important things about it. So this process uh, is idiosyncratic in that the hypotheses that I generate as I learn might be different from somebody else, meaning that the, the data that I collect might not be as useful for someone else. Uh, this process is biased by environmental structure, so uh, I'm constructing some represent representation of of the categories over time, and the relative salience of different features in the environment might affect uh, the kinds of hypotheses that I come up with. <coughs> and the process is um, constructive, in that I don't start off with kind of a massive hypothesis, uh, hypothesis space comprising all possible category boundaries uh, and just eliminate them over time, but rather there's this kind of hierarchical structure to exploration where I build up a representation um, uh, uh, as I learn. So I'm going to talk about three studies that kind of unpack all three of those ideas. Um, so the first study was our first attempt at comparing passive and active category learning. And then the second two are uh, follow-ups to the, to the first study, which take a closer look at the active uh, selection conditions and try to understand this hypothesis generation process. So in the first study, our starting point was uh, a prior experiment by Ashby and colleagues. Uh, um, if you are unfamiliar with category learning literature, this is kind of a very typical standard task um, involving two different kinds of category structures. On the left, you have a one-dimensional rule. So each point in this uh, plot is a stimulus, a category member. They're defined by two different dimensions, diameter and angle. So this is what two stimuli might look like in that space. Uh, so the left is the uh, 1D rule, and on the right is a 2D rule, where you have to take into account both feature dimensions to, to classify the items. And Ashby and colleagues have used uh, these two tasks to um, support a, a dual process model of category learning named COVIS, uh, 
the main assumption of which is that uh, really people can only generate and reason about simple one-dimensional hypotheses, and they can't learn about that more complex two-dimensional uh, rule through kind of rule-based reasoning. Instead, they have to rely on a kind of uh, procedural learning process. Um, so that was one reason why we wanted to start with this task. If, it's, if that's the case, then perhaps there's also a difference in whether or not people can exploit their uncertainty and reason about how, uh, how useful different items will be um, in the two-dimensional case. Um, so I'm going to refer to these stimuli as dial stimuli, just uh, keep that in mind. So we had four different conditions in this experiment. Um, so the first one is just a replication of the previous Ashby and Maddox uh, a study where people are learning through passive observation of items that are randomly generated from the category distributions, uh, and they're either learning a 1D or a 2D uh, boundary. The second is an active selection condition where they're learning their, uh, their goal is to learn the same category boundary, but now they have total freedom over which items they can select, select as they learn. So they can choose any, any points within the category, uh, within the stimulus space. And so on, on the first column, those are the kind of underlying category distributions. The second column is showing uh, the items that were actually chosen by one person, the participant, right? Now, one question we, that we had is, uh, well, is, it, is the benefit from active selection, that kind of intuitive explanation that I already offered, is it just that they can collect more informative data? Is that, is that just the only reason why they might uh, be better than uh, passive observation? So we had two additional exp uh, conditions who were yoked to the items that were selected by the active participants. So in the first yoke condition, people were naive, so they passively observed the same items that were collected by uh, earlier active participants, uh, and they weren't told anything about where the data was coming from. And then the fourth condition was an aware yoked uh, reception condition where Again, they're seeing the same items chosen from, by an active person, but now they're told, okay, there was another person who's just like you, who did this experiment yesterday, who was trying to learn the rule, so maybe that would help you um, to understand the, the reason behind their uh, decisions. Um, the procedure was uh, pretty standard, so in the passive reception condition, uh, people within each trial, people saw a stimulus that was randomly generated from one of the distributions, they saw the category label, and then they just had to confirm which, um, which category the item belonged to. In the active selection condition, they first saw a randomly generated item, but then they could uh, completely control which, which uh, stimulus they learned about. So they could alter the two stimulus dimensions, uh, and then query the category label, um, and they got feedback. Uh, after a set of training trials, then they'd have a test trial where they're just uh, having to classify items that are randomly distributed through the space, and there's this interleaved structure where people are alternating between training and test blocks. So what do the results look like? So first, uh, this is now looking at classification accuracy in those test blocks. So first, we, are, we replicate the same difference in passive reception that's been previously found by uh, Ashby and, and colleagues. So uh, learning through passive observation, uh, people are more effective at learning this simple 1D rule than a 2D boundary. Uh, interestingly, in the active selection case, for 1D boundaries, we find this benefit where people are able to learn more efficiently, so they, they achieve higher performance relative to the, to the passive reception case. But in the 2D case, there's actually no benefit uh, relative to the passive reception condition. So this already um, is at least some indication that the benefit of active selection might not be so universal, right? There's something. There's some difference between these two tasks that's causing people in the 2D, uh, active selection, selection participants in the 2D case to not really get any benefit from having control over the data that they're experiencing. And then finally, uh, in the yoked uh, reception <coughs> condition, uh, we find a persistent disadvantage relative to the active condition in both the 1D and 2D cases. So there's about a, a 5 uh, to 8 percent uh, disadvantage among the yoked observers. Again, even though they're seeing the same exact uh, uh, sets of stimuli in the same order that the active people did. So the next thing that we can look at is uh, the actual search behavior of the active participants. So which items did they choose from the stimulus space? And again, as I mentioned before, what you might expect to see is this kind of convergence towards the two true category boundary, if people are relying on this kind of uncertainty-driven exploration. And that's what we see in the 1D case, where over time, uh, there's this kind of clustering around the true um, one-dimensional category boundary. 
Uh, and if we look at a couple of uh, participants that were especially good at this, you can see that in the later blocks, they're really only choosing items that are right next to um, where the, the boundary lies. In the 2D case, we don't actually see the same convergence towards the true category boundary. So uh, selections are pretty diffuse throughout the entire task. Um, that being said, there were a couple of participants who did actually seem to uh, do, pretty good, do, do pretty well at this. So it seems that by the end of the task, they have the right kind of boundary in mind and they're choosing items that are along that, that diagonal boundary. So if we plot the, just the distance of, of people's samples from the true category boundary, then you see this decline in the one-dimensional case but not in the two-dimensional case. So that's one thing that the next study is gonna to try to understand is why we have this, this gap between 1D and 2D selection-based performance. Finally, in both uh, 1D and 2D tasks, the distance of individual samples from the true category boundary uh, was related to their classification accuracy. So this is plotting on the bottom, the average distance from the true boundary, and then on the left, uh, their average accuracy across all eight blocks. And there's this negative relationship where people who were uh, most likely to choose items that were really close to the boundary also were associated with the highest performance. And even though performance was lower in the 2D case, there was still the same relationship. So those 2D participants who selected items closest to the 2D boundary um, tended to have higher performance. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is that you might expect, as I mentioned before, if people are choosing items that are really close to the true category boundary, that's just objectively a really useful set of information. So a yoked observer who is learning from the same data should, so it should do pretty well. But in fact, we don't find this same relationship. So even among, uh, even for those participants who are uh, observing data that's really close to the true category boundary, they don't tend to do uh, any better. And in fact, in the one-dimensional one case, they tend to do the worst um, uh, um, from, from within their, their group. So this suggests to us that um, it's really not the objective distance from the true category that, that matters, but really whether people are able to make selections that are useful with respect to the, own, the, to the hypotheses that they're considering. Right? So if I have a hypothesis that might be somewhere far off in the space, but I'm able to choose an item that's, that's close to that and very diagnostic about whether I'm right, then that's going to help me learn much more quickly than if I'm a yoked observer and I have some other hypothesis uh, where the same information isn't uh, uh, that diagnostic. So to put those uh, words to a picture, you might imagine that an active participant is going through this task generating hypotheses about potential rules. And for each uh, rule that they generate, they sample an item that's close to the boundary. They get some disconfirming evidence, which causes them to shift it. Uh, again, they shift again, uh, perhaps considering the other uh, feature dimension as the relevant dimension, uh, and so on. But for a yoked observer who just by virtue of the fact uh, he's maybe started off with a different hypothesis in mind, or there's some uh, stochasticity where he's just sampling hypotheses that are, are a little bit different from the active person, then the same pattern of information is going to be less useful. So it's going to be less effective in, at driving his hypothesis towards the true boundary. So we have some modeling in the paper, which I'm not going to show here, but uh, uh, the upshot of it is that uh, if you assume no other differences between active and yoked participants, just the fact that one person has the ability to select information uh, that's useful to them and the other person doesn't, then you can recover the overall pattern of, of accuracy between these conditions. So to summarize uh, the first experiment really quickly, um, we found that active selection was more efficient than passive observation for learning 1D but not 2D category boundaries. Uh, for both uh, 1D and 2D rules, systematically sampling close to the category boundary was associated with better <coughs> performance. Uh, and there are these disadvantage from yoked observation of items chosen um, by active learners, uh, which we're arguing is consistent with this kind of hypothesis dependent sampling bias where the information that I collect uh, to, uh, to learn from myself might not be as useful for someone else. So now I'm going to turn to the second experiment, uh, and the goal of this experiment was really to understand why we, uh, sorry, why we, mm, sorry, why we found this big gap between active selection performance between 1D and 2D boundaries. This seems like uh, kind of a bad news for um, uh, the idea that active learning is, is really useful, and that if you just let people go off on their own and explore their curiosity, then they're going to do pretty well. It seems like people in this task, for some reason, can't acquire the 2D, the 2D boundary um, through active exploration. And in fact, it seems kind of consistent with the explanation uh, from that dual process model, COBUS, 
maybe it's just the case that people can't represent 2D hypotheses, and if they can't do that, then they can't uh, uh, gauge their uncertainty, and they don't really know which items to select. Um, so our thought in this experiment was that it's not really the fact that people can't generate 2D hypotheses and can't reason about 2D hypotheses, but really that the hypothesis generation process is biased by the particular stimulus uh, representation that we used for the first task. So uh, uh, learners generate candidate hypotheses about the category boundary by sampling salient features or relations from the, the task environment. And because we use these stimuli with highly distinct uh, features, people were biased towards just considering single dimensional rules that only considered one. Right? It's really hard to kind of think about the relative magnitude of the two features, which is what you need to do in order to generate a 2D hypothesis. So the, uh, the goal of the second experiment was to um, compare if we uh, consider an alternative representation of the stimuli where people are much more likely, uh, or it's easier for people to, uh, to compare the relative magnitude or inf integrate information about the two, two feature dimensions, will they be more likely to generate 2D hypotheses and will that allow them to learn more effectively through active uh, selection of data? So we did this by trying to uh, bias the hypothesis generation process using two different types of stimuli. The first were the same from the first experiment, uh, and the second are rectangle stimuli where the two feature dimensions width and height are commensurable. So it's really easy. Uh, you might even say it's automatic uh, uh, for people to uh, compare the, the two stimulus uh, dimensions. So uh, there are actually two experiments in the study. I'm only going to talk about the perceptual one because um, uh, I don't have a lot of time. Um, uh, the design is basically the same as in the first experiment, but now we're only looking at the active selection case. So all participants are getting to choose which items uh, they can learn about. Um, so there are four conditions overall, the two uh, stimulus types, and then again, people are learning either a 1D and 2D rule. And uh, uh, just to repeat it one more time, the prediction is that uh, people will be able to learn well when the stimulus representation is biasing hypothesis generation towards the right kind of rule, right? So for distinct features, like in the dial stimuli, that should cause people to consider one-dimensional hypotheses, that should, that should help them to learn. And uh, the, with the matched feature uh, dimensions in the rectangle stimuli, that should help people to learn 2D, 2D boundaries. And we're expecting this interaction where if you have an inconsistent feature representation, uh, then that should harm performance. So what did we find in, uh, in terms of classification accuracy? So this is basically showing a replication of the results from the first study, again, just with the dial stimuli, and just to uh, help you navigate the figure. So there are two colored lines on the top which correspond to the particular uh, category boundary people were trying to learn. So some people learned a boundary on angle, some learned on, on radius. And then the same color in the plot below is corresponding to the accuracy for that condition. So uh, basically, we find the same pattern of results where for the dial stimuli in the 2D case, people really can't uh, seem to learn through active selection. Now, if we change the stimulus representation, we find this improvement in performance for the 2D case, especially for a positive, uh, positively sloped 2D boundary, where suddenly people are really good at uh, uh, learning these boundaries. They're choosing items that are close to, close to the category boundary um, just by virtue of having a different stimulus representation. And interestingly, we find uh, a decrease in performance when uh, people are trying to learn a single dimensional feature boundary, but using these kinds of uh, rectangle stimuli where the feature dimensions are matched. So this seems a little bit surprising. I'm, uh, basically, people are just trying to, for example, learn that width is the only thing that matters. There's just some one dimensional rule on width that separates the categories. But because uh, the, the relation between the two features is so salient, then they're having trouble actually considering uh, that hypothesis. I'll just briefly mention that we basically find the same pattern as in the first study, where there's this relationship between the distance of uh, participant samples with their overall classification accuracy. So across the board, we find this negative relationship. Uh, the only exceptions are um, the, the kind of uh, the positively sloped 2D rec condition and the angle uh, in the 1D dial condition, which is basically a ceiling effect because people learn relatively quickly and then they kind of stop caring about which items they see because they're already at very high performance. Uh, and finally, for this study, I'll just mention that uh, you know we really want to show that uh, this manipulation of the stimulus representation is affecting the kinds of hypotheses that people are generating. Uh, 
So we take the, uh, the test responses uh, that people made and fit uh, linear, uh, linear, linear decision boundaries to their responses and then see whether or not they're single dimensional or two dimensional and then uh, see whether or not in the, in the um, uh, rectangle conditions people are more likely to, to respond according to these two dimensional category boundaries. And this is what we find just very quickly. Uh, so in the 1D dial case, basically nobody is responding according to a 2D boundary, whereas in the 2D rec condition, basically everyone is. And then in these inconsistent conditions, you find this interference effect, where because people have a stimulus representation that's inconsistent with the form of the rule that they're trying to learn, then uh, they're generating the wrong kind of hypothesis, and uh, uh, this kind of persists actually all the way through the end of the task. So to summarize uh, the results of this study, we replicated the gap between 1D and 2D accuracy given a distinct feature representation uh, in both a perceptual and an abstract task. Uh, and we also found that if you match the feature representations, then this leads to improved learning of 2D rules and actually impaired learning of 1D hypotheses. And the classification boundary modeling supports the idea that um, it's, this is really because it's biasing the kinds of hypotheses that people are generating. And hypothesis generation is, in a way, gating whether or not they can use active selection to learn. Um, yeah, so the, the kind of concluding point for the study is that uh, the opportunity to select data on its own is not really enough. The performance uh, really depends on how hypothesis generation is biased by the kind of salient features or relations that are found in the environment. So now I'll turn to the final study, and the goal of this one was really to more closely examine uh, the choices that people made in the, in the active selection case. So I showed you these plots already from the first study where uh, people seem to be converging towards the true category boundary over time, and I'm using that as kind of an indirect measure of uncertainty-driven sampling, uh, but we really don't know how uncertain people were about any particular item that they chose, right? It depends on what their beliefs were at any, any point in time. So in the next, um, oh, and I'll say, it could be that people in uh, both 1D and 2D conditions are really doing the same thing here, uh, but it's because they weren't able to, to generate 2D hypotheses that you didn't see that convergence, not because they're not using their uncertainty to drive their selection decisions. So in the third study, we're interested in directly modeling um, sampling decisions, and we borrowed from the machine learning literature uh, a set of heuristic sampling models that also cover an interesting range of psychological proposals for how people convert their, their current classification uncertainty into sampling decisions. So each model is going to assign um, a particular value to, uh, to items that, that vary in subjective probability, um, which I'm gonna kind of plot in this, this way for, for the binary case. Um, so for example, if somebody thought that uh, diameter was the relevant feature, then they might think that the item all the way to the left is uh, definitely category A, the item in the, in the, all the way to the right is category B, and then they're most uncertain in the center. So we're gonna look at three different models. The first one uh, was referred to as most certain, and this was intended to capture a kind of confirmatory sampling where people actually prefer to select items that they're already relatively confident uh, in how to classify. So according to this set model, anything uh, that occurs at the ends of the scales where they're already relatively confident, that has a high value and should be preferred, whereas anything that's in the center where they're very uncertain um, should be less likely to be chosen. In direct contrast to that, the second model uh, predicts that people will select items with the highest overall classification uncertainty. Um, this is referred to as label entropy because it amounts to calculating the entropy over the distribution of outcomes. Um, and of course, if the two outcomes are considered equally likely, then that's where entropy is highest. Finally, the last model is something of an uh, uh, intermediate position between the first two. So like the previous model, it assumes that people select items that they aren't sure how to classify, but that uncertainty is local in the sense that they really uh, prefer uh, items that could belong to any two categories, kind of independent of the third category. So this is consistent with the idea that people have to, when they're learning about complex category structures, that involve multiple classes, they decompose the problem into individual components, they prefer to target into pairwise uh, category boundaries and build up a co more complex representation over time. So this is referred to as the label margin model and it just amounts to taking the difference in subjective probability of the two most likely categories, um, uh, uh, ignoring the third. So one thing you might have already noticed is that uh, label entropy and label margin are going to be really hard to distinguish for the binary case. 
Uh, but we don't have this problem if we extend it to a three category problem. Um, so Jonathan has already kind of uh, shown this, so I won't uh, step through in too much detail. But this simplex now covers the whole possible space of different probability judgments for items. So the lower left corner is something that you're confident is A. The center is uh, an item that you're completely uncertain. All three categories could be equally likely. And then the midpoint of the edge is an item where uh, it could be A or, uh, sorry, it could be B or C, but you're really sure that it's not category A. So if we um, plot the predictions of the three models in this space, we now get this, this same kind of structure where label entry really prefers things that happen in, that uh, fall in the center. Label margin predicts anything where pairwise uncertainty is high, including uh, at the midpoints of all the edges. And then most certain prefers items that fall in the, um, in the near the vertices. So we tested the models. Uh, uh, by uh, now looking at a, uh, a three-category learning problem, uh, like the one shown here. And the most important difference from the previous procedure is that now we're going to directly measure uh, people's prob uh, subjective probability in the items that they're actually selecting. So again, people start by uh, seeing, a, seeing a randomly generated item. They can change the stimulus dimensions to be whatever they want. And then they do a series of probability judgments where they say, for this item that I've chosen, before I actually learn the category label, I'm going to say how likely it is that I think it's uh, uh, going to be classified as A, B, or C. And then they get feedback. And the only other important difference from the, the previous study is that now we have people repeat this kind of interleaved, um, uh, these blocks, until they reach a, a criterion. We then take for each item the set of probability judgments that people made, and we normalize that, and then that corresponds to a particular location in the simplex. And then for, uh, uh, for a participant, given all of, the, all of the items that they chose and their probability judgments, then we can fit all three of the models and see which one better describes their behavior. So just to quickly look at the results, uh, first we found that actually a majority of participants were best fit by the label margin model and about half were better fit by the label entropy model. And if you overlay all of the, the uh, probability judgments uh, across all the people uh, within each best fit model, then you see the same kind of pattern as the model predictions, right? For label entropy, it's kind of clustered in the center. For label margin participants, you get this kind of spoke structure, uh, where people especially prefer items that are in the midpoint of the edges. Importantly, we found that this difference between best fit models is also related to, uh, to performance. So among people who uh, were best fit by the label margin model, uh, 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 sorry, best uh, label margin uh, uh, participants were much more likely to have reached the learning criterion within the minimum number of blocks. And we still find this if we don't worry about model fitting and we just look within subjects uh, at the proportion of times they sample within each of these three regions, which roughly correspond to, uh, to the maximum of, of each of the models, then we still find that the only difference between participants who did and did not reach the learning criterion uh, is the proportion of times that they sample in this, in this uh, label margin region uh, near the midpoints. So, um, yeah, so uh, the, sorry. So uh, now this is, these results are based on directly measuring people's subjective probability in the items that they're choosing. And we think that this kind of local, local exploration that's captured by the label margin model is consistent with the idea that people are really building up a representation of this complex category structure over time. They really prefer to isolate local sources of, un of uncertainty rather than uh, items where they're just globally uncertain and, and any category could be uh, likely. Okay, so I'll quickly wrap up if my slide cooperates. Um, so we've shown, uh, in a number of cases now that people engage in this kind of hypothesis-dependent uncertainty sampling. We've shown that it allows people to learn 1D categorical rules more efficiently than passive learning from randomly generated data. We also find that there's individual variability in terms of how systematically people choose items that are close to the category boundary. I don't really have an explanation for where that variability comes from, but that's an interesting question to, to, to work on next. Uh, and there's this hypothesis-dependent sampling bias wherein information that's collected by an active learner doesn't seem to be as useful for a yoked observer of the same, same information. And I just want to highlight that uh, uh, Zee Sim and Fei Zhu um, and their co-authors recently basically found the same pattern of results for a 1D learning problem among five and uh, seven-year-old children. So it seems like 
this kind of uncertainty-driven learning of categories is something that, uh, that starts uh, at a relatively young age. Uh, the other large point is that uh, hypothesis generation seems to set the stage for active uncertainty-driven learning. So uh, the opportunity for selecting data on your own might not overcome the inability to, to generate the right kinds of hypotheses in the first place. And that hypothesis generation process is biased by the representation of the task environment, like the kinds of uh, 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 salient features or relations. And finally, there's this hierarchically structured exploration wherein, uh, when learning more plot complex rules, people seem to prefer local sources of, of uncertainty. So just to close, I want to uh, take a step back and think again about the place of active learning out in the real world. Um, I obviously think that it's really important to consider the fact that people are active learners. They take action based on their, their knowledge and their uncertainty. Uh, uh, to, to support their own learning. But I think it's no less important to consider that there might be limits of active learning. Uh, and I think that the work that I've shown today has started to suggest, at least in one domain, uh, that active learning is constrained by this kind of latent process of how people come up with new ideas, uh, which is itself influenced by many factors of the, of the environment and their goals, um, et cetera. So put another way, uncertainty and maybe even curiosity uh, rests on the existence of some kind of knowledge gap, but people may sometimes need a little help or support from their environment, like their teachers or their parents, to know that that gap exists. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Yes, Denise. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, very much. Uh, hello. Uh, quick question about the task in which you had a yoked learner, uh, which is a very interesting manipulation. I wonder whether you um, compared the performance of the yoked learner with just random selection. So in other words, even if the other person's model or hypothesis is not the one that is being entertained by uh, learner two, uh, they may have similar inductive biases in terms of generating novel hypotheses. And I would expect that learner two will eventually come up with a hypothesis which is fairly similar to what learner uh, one was testing. I don't know if you looked at that. That's what we expected. We especially expected it in the condition where they were aware that the data was coming from another learner, right? So it seems like if you know that there's another learner who's choosing these items, and sometimes in fairly systematic ways, like they might hold one dimension constant while varying the other dimension, then it seems like you should be able to reason about uh, what the hypothesis that they're testing. But we really didn't find that there's this kind of persistent disadvantage from being a yoked observer. Um, but I, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, there's a lot more to do to figure out, especially how to close that gap, especially because there are lots of real world situations where you might not have the ability to choose for yourself. You might just be forced to learn from other people. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great question. We have another question, Gianluca. So I am a fan of active learning, especially for school. So I was a bit disappointed to see that uh, the 2D case is already not so clear. So I wonder if this is due to the fact that your tasks are, are quite cognitive in a sense, that uh, there is not much involvement of action. So I wonder if active learning is much more powerful and uh, important, if action is, is involved more massively, for example, uh, for learning uh, models of the world where action appears as uh, an important element causing effects, or learning to do things. Mm -hmm. So motor skills, learning motor skills, for example. What do you think? Would you expect that their active learning is much more, makes a bigger difference? Um, I think that, um, so I think there are a lot of, lot of issues. I think that uh, having sort of physical kind of control or interaction uh, gives you um, uh, uh, not a dichotomous outcome. Uh, uh, so here we have a binary outcome. It's either A or B, you're either right or you're wrong, right? Often, I think that with a lot of the kind of uh, active learning um, environments where people are physically interacting, they have more of a continuous kind of thing where they can really experiment and feel themselves getting, getting better, right? We don't have the same kind of uh, ongoing feedback in this case that might, might kind of be uh, impacting performance. Um, but I think that, uh, um, I think it's a really good question because you're right that in, um, educational context in particular, active learning is, isn't really just one thing. It's not just about the selection of data. Educators think about active learning as, you know, there's this embodied thing where you are an actor, you are engaged in physical movement and collaboration. 
Um, so there might be a lot of things about that interaction that are really helping you to understand the problem space uh, and the, the possible outcomes um, that might, might help things. Yeah. Yes? I wonder if you worried in your 2D case with the, with the rectangles that they essentially subjects only have one hypothesis they'd entertain, which is the squares. And so it's in, I wonder if the, in your 2D rectangle case, if you were worried that subjects might only have this one 2D hypothesis they can really uh, easily entertain, which is the squares, because you show there's a huge difference between the, the square, um, the, you know, the positive versus the negative one. So did you actually look at any other, uh, other 2D boundaries that may be positive ones that were displaced from the square and show they can actually learn that quickly too? Otherwise, it would just be there selecting this one hypothesis, and of course, it's, if it's right, they're right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that, um, yeah, th this is a bit of a problem. That the, the, the positive 2D case was a little bit too easy, actually, right? And then you just had to kind of compare whether it was a tall shape or a, 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 a fat, a short shape. Um, and people, we know that people have this kind of strong shape bias, which might lead them to, to perceive that shape dimension uh, right off the bat. So we didn't find the same thing for the other 2D dimension, um, the negatively, negatively sloped one, which is kind of interesting because uh, in the model fitting, we do show that people are responding according to some kind of 2D boundary. It's just that they can't seem to, to, uh, to um, refine its location to the, to the true one. And part of it might actually be that um, the, the true boundary amounts to the, the, the total perimeter of the shape. So if the perimeter is above some value, then it's one category, and if it's below, it's the other value. But the kind of salient feature might be the overall area, which is a different, has a different relation to the feature, feature values. So people might actually be responding according to the strong kind of perceptual feature that, uh, that isn't quite right and they can't get past that. So it's another way in which this kind of, uh, in this case, perceptual bias is really affecting whether or not they can, can learn. But, yeah. Okay, Jacqueline? Um, Uh, we don't directly ask them to express frustration, although they inevitably do. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I yeah, the question was just whether or not people have a sense of how much they're learning during the task and if they express frustration about it. Um, uh, this is a good case where maybe if they could ask for a hint, then we might see that a lot, like they could ask for help uh, somewhere along the way because they know that they're just not getting it. Um, so they do get feedback. Uh, after each test block, they get feedback about the proportion of items that they responded to correctly. So they get this kind of intermittent feedback about their performance. Um, uh, but, but yeah, there's no other opportunity for them to kind of express frustration or get help from another, another source. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so um, the first brief question is, do people actually use labeling? Do you ask them if they come up with labels at the end of the, the learning procedure? Mm. Because one of your models is called label, but do they actually use that? And um, is indeed the case in the category learning literature that the 2D um, situations don't, the people don't use rule learning um, and they go more by prototype learning in those cases. So maybe whenever rule learning is not the appropriate uh, strategy, that's not going to be helpful. Um, so for, for the first question, um, we didn't really measure whether or not people come up or like generate labels uh, to, to refer to the categories or uh, the kinds of explanations that they come up with, um, but that'd be an interesting thing to look at. Um, it especially might be more likely in the active case, I think. Uh, for the second question, um, so that was kind of the original idea. There's this uh, dual process theory of category learning named COVIS, which suggests that for the 2D boundary, People just can't reason about that kind of complex boundary and they have to rely on the kind of procedural based learning, which is closer to the kind of exemplar based or prototype based um, process. I personally think that that's, <clears throat> um, that their view of um, rule based reasoning is pretty impoverished. So I think that in our case, we do have people who are able to think about 2D boundaries and to reason about them and to think about items that they're uncertain about with respect to that kind of a boundary. Um, it's just that with the, the stimuli that they tend to use and which we used in the first experiment, people are just unlikely to generate those hypotheses from the beginning. And they kind of just persist in using single dimensional hypotheses for a long time. And then eventually maybe they, they give up and resort on some other kind of learning process. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will uh, st stop the questions for now, continue during the breaks. So thanks again for your presentation.